Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you uh, for joining us this evening and welcome back to the next edition of Cancer and I. So we started off this series uh, in conjunction with World Cancer Day. And then I was just saying uh, how we've, we've really had a long World Cancer Day this, this year. But it's been good and, and I think uh, very informational for us to share with the wide variety of expertise and speciality that we have all across the country. Uh, in giving information different bits of cancer and that's really how big the whole kind of scope of cancer is. This evening we're very fortunate we are we're, we will be joined by three eminent physicians uh, who are with uh, Pantai Hospital Kuala Lumpur who is our partner for this segment of Cancer and I and uh, kicking off this evening will be consultant gastroenterologist and hepatologist Dr. Alex Liao Huang Rui. Dr. Alex, good evening. Hi, good evening, Dr. Morali. Nice to have you all and nice to see you all online. Ah, right. Such a pleasure to have you with us this evening and, and really, we're, we're truly fortunate. Uh, and and uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening. It is still March, Doctor, and, and uh, it is multidisciplinary management of colorectal cancer. It's, it's to do with colorectal cancer awareness month this month. And uh, you're one of those people who actually work very closely in the detection of colorectal cancer, mm, right? Yes. So right off the bat, doctor, and, and we always get all these weird questions that we kind of want to ask you, uh, ah. why the gut though? Why there's so many other non-messy parts of the abdomen or any other part of the body? Why did you choose to? <laughs> Destined to be a plumber. <laughs> well, uh, I guess, I think no one can deny that uh, gut is actually the longest organ in our body. And um, not only that, we also tend to treat the liver related diseases as well. So everything starts from what we eat. I like to eat. So I guess it's actually by nature that perhaps I chosen uh, uh, gastroenterologist as my profession. So yeah, there it is. Lovely. Lovely, Doctor. And Doctor, we, I also had a question to, to kind of share with our audience. A lot yep. of people see gastroenterologists but sometimes you see gastroenterologists and hepatologists. So what does this extra kind of uh, orgist mean? What, what, what is it additionally that you do? Yeah, so I think nowadays uh, the training for gastroenterologists sorry, encompass hepatologists as well. So in, the real, in reality, they all cover all digestive diseases, our, our digestive sy system. Our digestive system will comprise of liver, our stomach, our esophagus, up down to the, uh, the colon involving the small bowel as well. So it's literally, we are the doctor that treat liver related as well as stomach and large bowel related diseases. And to make the, 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 the area even wider, we also treat actually uh, pancreatic related diseases or even actually bowel duct related diseases like we do ERCP to, to relieve any blockage if there's any. So yeah, so this, this profession actually encompasses a huge uh, area regarding our digestive system. All right, lovely, doctor. Thank you, thank you so much for that that kind of uh, insightful comment on on actually what what gastroenterologists and hepatologists do. And quite frequently, I think we can see a rising number of cases of um, of uh, morbidity amongst like the liver. Uh, mm -hmm. And and I think yeah, this is kind of typical, I suppose, of this kind of more affluent yeah. population. Yes, yeah, I think as you correctly pointed out, the liver-related diseases, especially chronic hepatitis B, is quite prevalent in our country. Uh, hence, we tend to see a lot of uh, liver-related complications such as uh, hepatocellular carcinoma or liver cancer as well. Um, so yeah, this is pretty much a very important uh, disease. If you look at the prevalence of uh, cancer, I think liver as well as actually bowel, they are top of the list when it comes to cancer in our population. Right. And uh, today, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Alex is uh, here to talk about a different, more bawa segment of the gut, uh, <laughs> since we're all discussing the, the colon and the rectum today. And, and colorectal cancer is exactly what Dr. Alex is going to share with us um, this evening. And he's going to talk to us about risk factors, screening, and, and endoscopy management, uh, because you are an endoscopist as well, aren't you, Doctor? Yes, yes. 
Yes. So endoscopies exactly. is doctors that actually perform the scopes and uh, and uh, we do actually take out the... Uh, so later on, I'll share a video and then perhaps you all can have a better idea of what the scope about. Lovely. So I'm going to uh, just turn the, the screen over to you, doctor, and for us, you take us down this journey of the gut. Uh, it's all yours, doctor. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I already shared my screen. I hope you all can see it. So basically, I've been given a task to talk about uh, colon cancer. And colon cancer is a disease that uh, unfortunately involves every population in Malaysia. So it's undeniable, we'll see a lot of these kind of cases as time goes by because of uh, uh, the uh, more affluent uh, society that we are in now. So without further ado, let's move on to the uh, topics. So I'll be given a chance to talk about colon cancer. And today I'm going to stress on three words only. So if you've forgotten what I've spoken throughout the lectures, don't worry. Just remember, caution, check, and cut, which I'm going to actually talk about that at the end of the talk again. So colon cancer is a very common cancer. It's a type of cancer that it begins at the large intestine. So you can see over here, uh, this is where the beginning of the large bowel, and this is ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon. And then when we reach us here, it's a sigma colon, and until the end, it's our rectum. So the whole large colon is pretty much the end of a digestive system. And the colon cancer involved in this area is termed as colon cancer. And if you look at the nature or the type of colon, uh, colon cancer, predominantly or commonly, we do see adenocarcinoma, which is the commonest, uh, encompass about 90 to 94% among the patients that have uh, colon cancer. And it's very interesting to also note that 90% of time, 90% of time, all the cancer arises from adenomatous polyps. So meaning that if you are able to detect the polyps early, literally you're able to prevent the occurrence of colon cancer. So the, on our right-hand side, you can see that this is a picture just to uh, illustrate on the prevalence or the, uh, the uh, distribution of colon cancer in the large colon. Majority of colon cancer arises from the uh, rectal as well as the sigmoid area, which is uh, circled by the uh, red diagram over here. So 60% to 70% of cancer is at the rectum as well as sigmoid colon. Now, mostly the colon actually uh, uh, is quite actually about uh, 90 to 100 centimeter long. Some people, they are longer. But as I said, the commonest region is actually at the sigmoid colon and the rectum, which it contributed to the colon cancer. If you look at the data for Malaysia, um, so this is just a pie chart illustrating uh, the commonest cancer in our population. And this is the latest uh, data in 2020. If you look at it, colorectal cancer, in fact, is number two uh, commonest cancer in Malaysia. Uh, this is actually in the whole uh, uh, gender per se, throughout the whole gender. If you look into the males as well as female, they are equally number two as well. So in the male population, it's actually after the lung cancer, uh, colorectal is number two again. And then for female, number one is breast cancer and followed by colorectal cancer. How about worldwide? Well, overall, colorectal cancer ranks about third in the world uh, in terms of incidence, uh, new occurrence of the cancer. But unfortunately, they rank the second in terms of mortality, meaning that the death rate, unfortunately, is still pretty high, which is number two in the world. So every year, there's about 1.9 million of uh, colorectal cancer is being diagnosed. And the death rate, unfortunately, is about uh, nearly 1 million of them. And a lot of time, they also found that the correlation between colon cancer is very closely knitted with the socioeconomic status of certain country. Well, we probably postulated that this is because of sedentary lifestyle, as well as actually more animal-based source food and reduction in the uh, vegetables intake are all contributing factors to the occurrence of uh, colon cancer. Now, this is a very interesting study, uh, although it's done in Singapore, but as Singapore is very closely related to our population, you can see that over the years through 1968-2003, the prevalence or the incidence of uh, uh, new diagnosed uh, cases of colon cancer among the Chinese and the Malay equally uh, rises as years go by. So this actually depicts that the 
colon cancer is not exclusive to certain population. In fact, the whole ethnicity among the multiracial country like Malaysia all equally have a chance as, as well as the, the risk of acquiring colon cancer. And this is a very interesting uh, graph that I thought is uh, interesting to show to you all. If you look at the incident rate of a various uh, country from Asia to uh, America, as well as New Zealand, and then to the Europe, you can see that Japan, the incident rate or the new cases of colon cancer throughout the years has actually plateaued and even showing signs of reduction. And Singapore, if you look at our neighbor, they are also showing signs of plateauing as well. If you look at United States, the graph is declining already. So meaning that they are getting less and less colorectal cancer diagnosed in that particular country. And why is that so? Now you look at New Zealand, New Zealand is also uh, dropping down. Uh, whereas for the rest of the world, of the, uh, if you look at England, England is still showing slope or going up. But if you look at France, France is already plateauing as well. So literally the country that have reduction in incident, it has something to do with either they have declined in the risk factors such as uh, maybe decline in smoking behavior. And the other thing is because of the effective screening program that instituted by that particular country. So if you are able to screen colon cancer early, even actually up to the level of detecting the polyps, once you've taken out the polyps, then you realize that the progression of cancer is hotter and then that, that actually reduces the occurrence of colon cancer in the future. And the other thing is that in the United States, uh, in about 2000, in the year 2018, the, the, we used to say that the screening age for colon cancer is 50 year old. But as shown in the 2008, the American Cancer Society proposed that the screening age of colon cancer should be even lower down to 45 year old. This is because we are seeing more and more younger generation of patient acquired uh, colon cancer. So what are the risk factors as well as symptoms uh, when it comes to suspicion of uh, colorectal cancer? Number one is that if you have change of bowel habit. So what do we mean by change of bowel habit? Meaning that uh, before this, you were able to pass motion normally, but suddenly you realize that how come my, my stool has become actually more watery or loose stool? Or on the other hand, suddenly you start uh, having a prolonged constipation without any reason, even though you have taken enough water, you have taken enough uh, fibers, you shouldn't have any risk of uh, uh, having constipation. So if you have change in bowel habit, be careful. Now, of course, certainly if you have rectal bleeding or you have actually blood in the stool, these are all alarming signs that shouldn't be taken uh, lightly because it could mean that Either this is just a simple hemorrhoidal bleed, which also need a further assessment by your doctor, or it could mean that you can have other diseases such as an inflammatory bowel disease, which involve the inflammation of the bowel, or the worst condition would be colorectal cancer. The other things that actually uh, contributed by the symptoms would be if you have sens uh, sensation of incomplete defecation. After passing motion, you still feel like, oh, I still want to go to the toilet. It's like incomplete defecation, incomplete uh, passing motion. So this is another symptom, abdominal pain, right? So all these are symptoms related to potential uh, colon-related uh, diseases. The risk factors will be if you have sedentary lifestyle, you have alcohol, smoking, and then uh, poor dietary intake, meaning that if you reduce in the vegetables intake, low fiber intake, and then diabetes and obesity, all these are the risk factors for colon, uh, colorectal cancer or colon cancer. Now, if a patient had colonoscopy before and it was found that a person had these uh, polyps and the risk is always there. So that's why a patient with uh, polyps after colonoscopy, they will be advised to come back for further uh, surveillance as well as screening the future. Now, other non-modifiable factor would be uh, age. If a patient grow older, the risk of colon cancer is actually higher. Or if there's any family history, this means that the potentially there may be genetic lineage among the family that may acquire the cancer. And lastly, is the inflammatory bowel disease, as I mentioned just now, is involved in inflammation of the bowel. In this group of patients, they potentially have a higher chance of acquiring disease if the disease is not well controlled. The next thing is that there's also an interesting point to, to, uh, to note over here is that the location of cancer, whether it's right side of the cancer, uh, right side of the colon or left side of the colon, the presentation is slightly different. 
So in this picture, I draw a line over here. Basically, the line over here depict uh, what, this is actually where the uh, ascending column is. And the, this is also being termed as the right side of the column. Often, if you have colon cancer that arising at this region, uh, patients are usually asymptomatic because over here, the, the space is huge. The mass will need to build up very, very large before they can contribute to symptoms. All right. And then, so as I said, that 70% of them actually has no symptoms. But fortunately, rarely cancer arises at this region. As I said earlier, the cancer usually occurs in the left side, which is the end of the large bowel. But having said that, do actually watch out because 30% of them may present with a lump over the region on the right side of the abdomen. Now, then the left side will encompass from this hepatic flexure, so somewhere around here until the end of the large bowel. And usually, a patient will present with either diarrhea or even bleeding. So these are all the symptoms related to left-sided uh, colon, colon cancer. And sometimes they may have the sensation of uh, this uh, defecation, incompleteness, as well as actually discomfort when they pass uh, feces. So this will encompass uh, symptoms of uh, colorectal cancer at the rectum area. Now, we mentioned just now, colorectal cancer, about 90% of them actually arises from polyps or adenomatous polyps. So this is a diagram to show that when the cell in the, the lumen of the large bowel undergoing some mutation, mutation means that change in the genetic material, then they will start forming uh, this, what we call as adenomatous polyps. So adenomatous poly is a kind of polyp that has a higher chance of becoming something nasty. And throughout the time, through, as time goes by, they go through a process called dysplasia. Now, I always explain to my patient, what is dysplasia? Dysplasia is a medical term. Dysplasia, if you translate into layman term, it just means that displaced, meaning that the cell is actually being changed to other type of cell. Now, repeatedly, if you have this cellular change or this change of cell, then ultimately, error may occur. Now, when error occur, that's when a person may have the risk of becoming colon, uh, the cell may become colon cancer and ultimately become adenocarcinoma as depicted in this picture. So just to summarize by saying that, so if your genetic mutation occurs around the normal epithelia, that will start forming uh, polyps. And usually this type of polyp is still benign. Then they will, uh, they will go through a process called dysplasia. And from dysplasia, if you don't intervene, there may be a chance that you will progress into cancer of the colon. So when we do colonoscopy, this is what we're going to see. So this is normal uh, mucosa or normal lining of the large bowel. And then this is polyps. As time goes by, when the polyps grow bigger, it gone through the process of dysplasia. And if it's not stopped, then it will turn into cancer. So this is uh, the bottom is the one that actually have the flat polyps. And this type of flat polyps, if it progress, then it becomes cancer as well. So this is the, the progression of a normal cell to become polyps and ultimately from polyps, it turns to cancer. So if you're actually able to cut it, then literally you're cutting down the risk of progression of these polyps into malignancy or colorectal cancer. So I thought it's interesting that we just want to show you all a video clip on the polyps. So this is essentially a patient of mine that undergone colonoscopy and this is a polyps. We call this type of polyps sessile polyps. So it's actually a bit uh, elevated uh, compared to a flat polyps. So what I've done over here is that I try to examine the polyps first to see what's the nature of the polyps. And ultimately, you can see that I protrude out a needle. And this needle is to inject a solution to separate the polyps from the bottom of the uh, lining of the mucosa. This is important because when you do that, you can see that the polyps become more obvious now. At the same time, the cushion that created by this uh, injection prevent perforation when we actually take it out. So now I put up a snare. So this is a snare that passed through the scope and then the snare will capture these polyps and ultimately we're gonna cut it. So now I'm actually trying to position the snare in the proper position. And you can see that I'm about to capture the polyps already. And then once I capture the polyps, I burn it and that's how I cut the polyps out. So the whole process is very fast. It takes about maybe perhaps two to three minutes and then we'll send these polyps for further analysis. So this is a process called polypectomy. Now, for the next couple of slides, I basically, I'm just going to illustrate on the risk factors of colorectal cancer. 
Age is a major risk factor. So if you look at this uh, age-specific cancer incident per 100,000, as we grow older, the incident rate of uh, colorectal cancer arises. And if you look at the cumulative frequency of cancer cases by age, the older we are, the higher the chances of colorectal cancer occur. So age is an important factor. Now, other than age factors, another factors that contribute to the risk of colorectal cancer will be family history. If you look at this uh, table, the one that highlighted by the red uh, column is are those uh, first degree relatives with colorectal cancer. Now, if you have three, more than three uh, family members, that, first degree family members that are being diagnosed of colon cancer, and if you look at the age, if a person age is 50 year old, the chance of getting a colorectal cancer is about 7.6%, the absolute risk uh, percentage. If you look at a person that only 50 year old, but without any family members of uh, colorectal cancer, the risk is only 0.9%. So there's a 7% increased risk of those with family history of more than three. So from here, we know that the two factors that determine or the two factors that contributed to colorectal uh, cancer occurrence would be age as well as the family history. So if there's, any, if there's a family history of colorectal cancer, then the risk of uh, absolute risk is, uh, if you have one first degree, then it's 9%. If you're more than first degree, uh, more than one first degree with uh, colorectal cancer, then the risk increases to 16%. Now, if you look at it, this is more than one, but this is only one. So if the younger the subject is, the younger the relative being diagnosed of colorectal cancer, the risk of it acquiring is also very high. So it's equivalent to two, more than one uh, first degree relative that actually have colorectal cancer. This, so this depicts that the younger the age of the person that being diagnosed, then the likely, the more likely that it's actually genetically uh, uh, aff uh, affected or genetically run in the family. So just now we talk about polypectomy. So if you have history of polypectomy and you want to ask, how soon, how soon and how frequent should I get another colonoscopy done in a few years' time? So if you have actually one or two low-grade dysplasia, don't need to worry. So you can repeat the colonoscopy in five years or 10 years' time. But if, let's say, involve high-grade dysplasia, usually we tend to advise to repeat the colonoscope within three years' time. Or if the polyps is a lot, uh, three to 10, then you may want to actually repeat it earlier as well. Uh, so if it's actually flat polyps, because flat polyps actually have a high chance of uh, uh, colorectal cancer changes, so we usually advocate that you may need to get it checked uh, even earlier. How about those that are at risk? Remember, I was saying that inflammatory bowel disease is a, is a, it stands a higher chance of colorectal cancer. Uh, so for those with actually colorectal, uh, these are inflammatory bowel disease like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, we usually advocate that you may want to get a colonoscopy done in one or two years every year. Uh, if the diagnosis is actually late already, uh, eight years after the diagnosis of pancolitis, 10 to 12 years for those with uh, segmental colitis. So colitis means that you have inflammation of large bowel. So literally, the take-home message for this is that if you have inflammatory bowel disease, the doctor usually will advise you for earlier colonoscopy to pick up whether there's any risk of changes. So how about those that have been diagnosed uh, uh, colorectal cancer and gone through surgery? Dr. Lokman is going to talk about uh, uh, surgical management of uh, colorectal cancer. So usually, if after the surgery, if it's stable, uh, we usually perform another colonoscopy one year after the surgery. If stable, then we repeat every three yearly. Uh, and then if it's continued to be stable, then we repeat every five yearly. Uh, so if it's actually rectal cancer, because we fear that the recurrence is higher, so usually uh, we will advocate that it's what I mentioned earlier, but then rather than every five yearly, we recommend that for long-term wise, every two yearly to three yearly, may need to go through a uh, colonoscopy for further surveillance. So this slide is basically just to, uh, to compare between the two methods that we use to screen for colorectal cancer. One is fecal or cow blood, and the other one is colonoscopy. Of course, the benefit of fecal or cow blood is that it's cheap, uh, and then it's not painful. You don't need to go for any uh, preparation. Uh, but then the downside of this uh, fecal cow blood is that you're not able to detect polyps because we, are, we usually actually only detect bleeding uh, uh, cancer so if you want to detect polyps, this is not a good method. So the, and then the other thing is actually the false negativity is also high. Whereas compared to colonoscopy, 
the good the good thing about it is that you can have direct visualization of the lumen and then we are able to detect polyps and if there's any polyps we will straight away cut it down as i mentioned earlier if you cut it out then the risk of colorectal cancer actually reduce and then but the downside is that it's expensive uh, it's uncomfortable because you need to drink solution to clear your bowel and then the other thing is of course there's always a, a minute risk of perforation but the risk is actually low so but then it's, it's always there so if you compare with fecal cow blood certainly colonoscopy has certain risks that a patient would need to understand so in summary i would like to say that colon cancer is quite common uh, it's uh, quite common among uh, every any city watch for the symptoms do, do aware, I mean, do uh, notice if you have any altered bowel habits such as uh, diarrhea or constipation changes. Age and family history are the predicted uh, risk. And then people more than 45 years usually will advocate that please go and check either by fecal cow blood. And if you have done so, perhaps actually by colonoscopy to detect any polyps as well. And lastly, I would like to say is that polypectomy can prevent colon cancer. So with that, I would just like to reiterate again, caution watch for your symptoms, check before it's too late. So if you have any symptoms, please get checked. And ultimately, if you cut the polyps out, we can actually save life. And this is how the, uh, the prevention of colorectal cancer is about. And I hope I'm actually able to deliver my lecture. Thank you for your attention. And I would love to accept any question if there's any. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor. What I really am starting to enjoy about these sessions is uh, the, the way how uh, all of y'all managed to, within 20 minutes, amazingly pin, paint such a vivid picture of, of kind of giving uh, everyone, uh, uh, I, I don't want to say that in, in one McDonald's burger, <laughs> everything <laughs> that you have to do with, uh, that you have to do with, with uh, the problem. Doctor, there's a couple of questions and, and I know you said you'd be happy to take them. Um, yep. I'm going to just kick right into them. Um, the first is, uh, from one of our viewers, is this cancer found in children? Colorectal cancer, I think. Well, I'm actually adult, uh, adult uh, uh, gastroenterologist, so I seldom see kids. Uh, but what I noticed is that uh, recently, the age of diagnosis for colorectal cancer has dropped tremendously. So I have seen patients that 20 over years old came with uh, advanced uh, colorectal cancer. And then uh, I think Lokman will agree with me because I always refer cases to him as well. Uh, we tend to see younger and younger patients, not, com not, not common, but I must say that not uncommon either. So I guess they, they came to us with symptoms of this uh, per rectal bleeding. And then based on the age, you would think that this is probably just hemorrhoidal bleed. But then when we did a scope, and we are surprised to find out that unfortunately it's colorectal cancer and it's already actually metastasis to the to the liver and then it's very pitiful yeah but i guess the pediatrics group i'm not sure uh the prevalence because i as i said i'm an adult gastroenterologist but those genetic related colorectal cancer usually they present early right and um, i think you were saying also doctor just to kind of draw on that question uh when somebody with colorectal cancer kind of presents within your family is it kind of uh too much or too cautious for us to actually get everybody within the family to actually go and screen, get a chronoscope done. Um, and, and is there like a minimum age? Oh, let's say someone in your in your direct family gets cancer and they're like, and you're like 25, 26, they're like, oh, it's okay, I got 10 more years to worry about. What do you think of it? So I think the, the, there's a change in the trend when we talk about screening of uh, colorectal cancer. Uh, we don't like to pick up cancer nowadays. We like to prevent cancer. So if you look at the, 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 the evidence, uh, usually they advocate that even actually with family history, uh, so the age that you may want to start screening is about 40 year old, all right? But we always also use these rules that you, you minus 20 years for the person that being diagnosed with uh, colorectal cancer before. So for instance, just give an example. If a family member was diagnosed of colon cancer as about 50 year old, we usually advocate minus 20 years earlier. So this means that the family members may consider screening at 30 years old, right? So it all depends on how early the, the, the cancer was diagnosed in that particular uh, index case or index family members. Um, don't do it too early because if you do it too early, then you probably would not be able to pick up any polyps as well. So the purpose of doing early colonoscopy is also to pick up polyps. 
so that if you're able to cut out the polyps, then you will actually able to reduce the risk and prevent the progression into colorectal cancer. You know? So I would say that uh, perhaps not too early, but uh, depends on the index age. And then if there's no history, then perhaps the best age to do colorectal cancer screening will be 45 year old. Right. Um, doctor, just to kind of add on to that question as well, and, and really um, how to say, I, I like getting it from you because it's, it's from the horse's mouth. And I hope that our viewers will then kind of take this a little closer to heart. Um, I, I think one of the things that we all kind of always forget is, uh, oh, for Malaysians, we are just lazy. And then, you know, uh, sometimes malasla. Uh, shouldn't this be performed as in like colonoscopy? Shouldn't it be done periodically as well? Well, if, if possible, of course, but the thing is that colonoscopy also adds a certain amount of cost to the, uh, the treatment. And then, uh, so that's why it's never always used as the first methods of a population-based screening program for colorectal cancer. And even for those uh, advanced countries also, they can't do that as well. So, but then we realized one thing is that for those countries that do this kind of colonoscopy related uh, colorectal screening, their incident rates of color cancer actually reduces. And all actually boils down to the fact that you're able to perform polypectomy and that will actually right. greatly reduce the risk of uh, colorectal cancer. So if a person uh, is affordable and there's always the risk factors there, then I'll probably say that yes, colonoscopy will be probably more accurate compared to fecal or cow blood. Because fecal or cow blood, unfortunately, when it's positive, it may be too late already because there's already the process of malignancy already occurs. But colonoscopy, on the other hand, is to pick up the precursor of colorectal cancer. Right. And, 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 and very interesting, ladies and gentlemen, one of the kind of uh, good things about colorectal cancer, nothing's good ever about cancer. Let me, let me make that clear. But uh, you know, one of the good things about colorectal cancer is one of those things that, as Dr. Alex was telling us today, it's possible to go back and prevent it from actually ever happening. And, and that is a, is a mindset change that needs to come within all of us. Uh, doctor, um, uh, so let's say, and this is quite often a question we get asked, um, like when I start screening, I do a colonoscopy and then uh, do I then do a FOBT every other year and then do a colonoscopy some years? What do you think is like the good mix? Yeah, I think this I is a relevant. Yeah, this is a relevant question. So it depends on the outcome, the first index colonoscopy. If the first index colonoscopy is normal, then usually we'll advocate that you probably need to do another colonoscopy in 10 years time. Don't need to do every year FOBT again because uh, the risk of malignant will be very low because you just had this screen. And if there's any polyps, you already by then already resected. Now, if there's polyps, then it all depends on the number of polyps. If the number of polyps is more than three, usually we advocate that you may want to get it checked earlier. So like three yearly. And other things that determine whether you get it checked earlier would be the histology. So the type of tissue that we talked about just now, the dysplasia. Now, if the dysplasia is actually moderate or high grade, then you may want to consider uh, getting your colonoscopy done earlier. Uh, so these are all the basic uh, rules. But of course, when it comes to individual, it may change, but this will serve as a guideline for us to practice the, during our day, day, day in, day out when, when we see our patient. Right. Lovely, Doctor. I've got just one more question. Um, sure. And this is on, if there's a patient with colorectal cancer, which specialty shall he visit? Gastroenterologist or oncologist? I'm thinking that this is for the first visit. So That's if let's say, now, the first thing is actually, if this diagnosed already, I would advise that straight away, you need to decide whether uh, you're going to go for surgical treatment or you're going to go for oncology. I think Dr. Lokman and Dr. Masura will equally share their view on this. As a gastroenterologist, our main job is mainly to get diagnosis. So if you haven't gotten a diagnosis, you probably need to see a gastroenterologist to get the tissue diagnosis. Once confirmed already, then you can go for surgery. Now, sometimes if you have symptoms of obstruction, I will actually advise straight away to see a surgeon because you may need a surgery as soon as possible because the risk of perforation is always high. So it depends on the, the scenario. But to, to make it simple, if you're not sure, then perhaps just go to your nearest gastroenterologist and get it checked as soon as possible without further delay. Okay. Uh, doctor, one final question, doctor, if you're okay to take that. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. 
Uh, doctor, there is, um, I think one of our audience members asked, what is the difference between the FOBT and the FIT in terms of sensitivities and specificities uh, yeah, between sorry. the tests? So in the old days, uh, people used to look for red blood cell, but red blood cell sometimes is not accurate. So there are actually immunohistochemistry, which is actually more accurate. So this is where the sensitivity and specificity differ if you compare between two. So nowadays, I think most of the FOBT is actually immunohistochemistry already. So it's more accurate. Yeah. Yeah. So just, just uh, for, for the member of the audience uh, who's asking this, just kind of be aware that within Malaysia, almost all the labs actually using immuno, uh, it's IFOBT, so it's actually the equivalent of an FIT in that sense. So it's terminology rather than anything else. Um, having uh, brought that kind of uh, questions uh, to an end, doctor, I would like to, I think, if you could, flash us back that last slide and sure. uh, kind of give us again that takeaway for this evening. That's a lovely slide. Sure. Uh, let me just... Uh... Uh, put it out again. Sorry, I wasn't prepared for that. Uh, yeah, no, sorry. <laughs> uh, just give you a second. All uh, right. Uh, yep. Do you see it? Okay. You see it? Yes, we yes we do, doctor. So um, and and perhaps you could just kind of reinforce that message back to us for this evening, doctor. So I, as I said from the very beginning of my talk, you can't remember anything that I mentioned today. Do remember these three words, caution. Look for any symptoms. If you have any symptoms, do get it checked as soon as possible. Check before it's too late. And ultimately, if you are able to cut away the polyps, polytectomy literally saves life. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, doctor, for joining us this evening. Lovely set of... Uh sharing uh, and insights that you that you gave us. So cut before it's too late. Um, there's a way to prevent colorectal cancer before it even happens. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank Alex you. Liao, the government consultant, gastroenterologist and hepatologist at Pantai Hospital Kuala Lumpur, our partner for Cancer and I this evening. And um, it's kind of leading the next segment of the talk. So um, Dr. Alex spoke to us about um, endoscopy and, you know, um, gastroenterology, and that's the relationship of the physician with managing uh, colorectal cancer and kind of picking it up. Next talk, we have an eminent colorectal surgeon. So this is the samurai man. Uh, he, uh, and, and uh, so Dr. Lokman Maslan, Dr. Lokman Maslan is a consultant colorectal and general surgeon with Bantai Hospital Kuala Lumpur. And um, a lot of people need no introduction to Dr. Lokman, as, as uh, Dr. Alex, of course, uh, uh, Dr. Lukman is, is uh, quite um, uh, a renowned uh, colorectal surgeon and uh, speaks quite a bit on colorectal cancer. This is really an area, I think, of close interest to, to his heart. Uh, actually, lower down, actually. Uh, to, uh, area of close interest to his colon, perhaps. And uh, what, is, what is also good is, and Dr. Lukman has got a special interest in another area, which is in nutrition. And he's going to touch on that a bit, I hope, today a little bit as well. Um, and uh, I am very pleased to have Dr. Lukman with us this evening. Good evening, Doctor. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Murali. Uh, thank you very much for having me here again. It's a, a pleasure. And I'd like to congratulate you on a great program. I like the way how you, uh, you formulate it as a multidisciplinary team. Um, and you've got two of my great colleagues with me here today. So, and me being placed right in the middle is generally what the flow of, uh, of the patient experience will be. They usually will see uh, Alex first and then they come and see me and then, uh, you know, they, they, they might end up seeing Dr. Mastura uh, after. Right, exactly, Doctor. And, and, and uh, I think one of the good things that all of y'all have kind of stressed over this, this past many, many sessions is that how cancer has really become a multidisciplinary uh, thing that needs to be approached by multiple doctors working together hand in hand to kind of address it as well. So doctor, you, you are joining us this evening to speak about surgical management of colorectal cancer. And I think one yes. of the kind of emerging, emerging kind of notes from this entire series, a lot of feedback that we get is how people are really terrified of doing surgery, especially in colorectal cancer, because they're, they're kind of stuck with this thought that, oh no, it means I'm going to get a stoma and that's the end of me. Yes, I'm, so, I'm glad uh, you... 
Yeah, yeah, exactly, doctor. So I'm hoping that you will help to kind of um, break through that myth and I'm gonna turn the screen right over to you to kind of uh, speak to us uh, about this. Thank you, doctor. Right, thank you. So um, I'm just gonna share my screen. Are you able to see this? Okay, so um, thank you very much once again. And I'm going to take it uh, from Alex to, uh, to describe and discuss about the surgical management of colorectal cancer. So in, in many times uh, when patients are diagnosed with uh, colon cancer um, and the endoscopy is done either by Alex himself or, or by me, um, then, then the patients will be referred to me um, for uh, surgery, uh, unless you know, there are very exceptional cases where, where surgeries are not done. For example, if the patients are very weak or if the cancers are just too advanced. So um, my, my talk will be on that. And I will talk about the perspective of the patient, the, the patient's journey. But generally before that, um, I just like to, to divide uh, or, or, or shift the attention really to uh, the kinds of surgery that can be done. Uh, for uh, colorectal cancer. Um, so uh, the patient can either present as an emergency or the patient can present as in, in an elective setting, meaning the surgery is planned. Now, of course, uh, like what Dr. Alex says, there are many symptoms of colorectal cancer and patients who present with uh, uh, massive bleeding, okay, or they can present with uh, bowel obstruction uh, caused by the uh, cancer or in very, uh, in the worst case scenario, that what can happen is that um, the, the pressure builds up to a point where there is a hole in the bowel and then you might get a bowel perforation. So these obviously would require emergency surgeries. And um, I, I will not uh, touch on that too much because when I describe about, um, about how we manage uh, uh, colon cancers uh, through surgery, um, that will also be uh, described. So I will probably talk more of um, the patient's journey in an elective setting. So how it begins is usually the patient will come to see the surgeon in the clinic and then he'll be admitted. He'll go undergo surgery. He'll go back to the ward. And then after his discharge, he will come and see me back in the clinic, right? So in the clinic, um, the patient will undergo a, uh, uh, an interview in a way or a, an assessment by me. And, one of the main things that I will first look at is um, his symptoms, and then I will look at his colonoscopy. Um, to, the main aim of this is to locate exactly where the tumor is, because uh, depending on the location of the tumor, it would determine the kind of surgery that would be done. And I will show more of that later. So once, the, once we know the location of the tumor, then the next question would be, what is the stage of this tumor? And in that case, most of the time, the patients will already have come to me with a CT scan or in the case of rectal cancer, um, together with an MRI. If this is not done, then I will uh, organize this. So I need all this information to, um, to help me decide what would be the best uh, kind of surgery for this patient. Now, since we're talking about stages of uh, colorectal cancer, um, this is just a short video that basically shows that like what Dr. Alex says, it all starts with a small growth called a polyp. And with time, if this polyp gets bigger and it gets bigger, um, it can invade through the wall of the colon. And if it does that, then it becomes stage two, right? Now we know that there are lymph nodes that follow the blood supply to the colon. And if these lymph nodes are, are, uh, are affected, then, um, then uh, they are coming stage three. And unfortunately, if it goes to the liver or the lung, then it would be uh, stage four, right? So those are the stages of colorectal cancer. And Dr. Mastura will obviously talk about uh, the treatment of that, especially if it's stage three, stage four. Now, one of the things that uh, is done in the clinic is I will review, as I said, all these tests, and then I will take a, a consent for surgery after describing the details of the surgery. And then I will set, um, you know, the date and time of surgery, depending on, how urgent it is or not. I will get the admission documents ready and I will advise the patient on uh, what to prepare and the diet and the nutrition. Now, um, with regards to diet and nutrition, 
I, I didn't have specific slides on this, but all I like to say is that surgical uh, surgery is is uh, is is um, gives a very high amount of stress to the body. It's like asking a person to run in a way for a marathon. And if you can imagine a cancer patient who's weak because of the cancer, he hasn't been eating well, he's been losing weight. And if he doesn't eat well prior to surgery, which gives so much stress, then uh, you expect poorer outcomes. So if you ask a marathon runner to not eat for the past one week, he has lost weight, you ask him to run, he will, he will collapse. So similarly, if the patient is not uh, adequately nourished, then after surgery, um, you expect complications to occur, all right? Now, um, the most important part obviously is on, on this talk and I will also discuss with the patient in the clinic is about the surgery itself, the technical uh, aspects of it. Now, uh, as Dr. Alex has shown, this is the colon. The colon is the large uh, bowel, right? Now, if you look at it, um, uh, the colon stretches all the way from the appendix on the on the right, and then it, it goes all the way up to the uh, to the rectum. Now, for surgeons and for for doctor, you know, for people who treat colorectal cancer, we separate the colon and the rectum. They're, they're like two different organs. So the so the rectum is basically towards the end of the of the uh, of the colon, uh, and the, the 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 difficulty about treating the rectum is that it is enclosed within the, the pelvis or the hip bone, right? And it, especially in a male where the pelvis is not big, because in a female, the, the pelvis is bigger to, to accommodate uh, delivery of, of a child. Um, in a male pelvis, it's really very narrow. So the challenge is performing surgeries there. So this is just a picture of how um, the colon uh, has been removed. And this is uh, one of the patients I did where we removed the whole colon, right? So as what Dr. Alex said, most of the tumors are on the left side, which probably would include the rectum. So this is a, sorry, these are pictures of, of, uh, of, what, um, of uh, what the uh, tumor of the rectum or the colon would look like. You can imagine I have cut open the colon and I've showed you what the tumor actually looks like. And this kind of uh, tumors can cause bleeding, they can cause blockage. All right, and this is a different kind because you can see this narrowing right in the middle of the bowel and that, and this patient presented with uh, intestinal obstruction. Right, now, after the, the patient has seen me in the clinic, I have arranged the date for surgery. The patient gets admitted to the ward on the day. Usually, what, uh, the patient is admitted the day before, uh, most of the time. And in which case, then a nurse will come and see, the eye will come and see, the anesthetist will come and see, so as I said, it's a really a multidisciplinary team management. We will do some blood tests to check the heart. You know, we will, sometimes it's required to even clean the bowel because even though I'm a colorectal surgeon, I don't really like to see uh, stools or, or, or feces. So I like to clean the bowels before I do surgery. Uh, and then the patient will, will be fasted for about four to six hours before surgery, right? So the, on the day of the surgery, the patient will be wheeled in into the surgery and the surgery will be done under general anesthesia. Surgery will take about two to four hours, sometimes a little bit more. And again, it's a really a team effort of surgeons, anesthetists, my assistants, nurses, and there'll probably be about five to eight people sometimes in the, in the, um, in the uh, operating room. And the patient is all the time uh, unconscious and you, know, you probably won't be aware until it's all over. So the general concepts in, uh, in colorectal cancer surgery is basically that um, you have these lymph nodes, these things in green here that actually follow the blood supply. And when we do operations on the bowel, we just cannot remove the bowel alone. You have to remove the bowel and the lymph nodes together with the blood supply. Because if you leave these lymph nodes behind and cancer has entered these lymph nodes, then, uh, then you run the risk of uh, the cancer coming back. And that's what you don't want. So when we do a surgery uh, on the right side and we remove the right side of the colon, that surgery is called a right hemicolectomy. Uh, if we remove uh, part on the left side, that's called a left hemicolectomy. And if you remove part of the uh, rectum or you know, the sigmoid colon, then that would be called an anterior resection, right? Now, the next question is, let's take, for example, left hemicolectomy. When we remove the bowel, right? Let's say we remove it, then you have really two ends. And what do you do with these two ends? Well, 
unless it's really, really an emergency and you can't join the bowel, and I'll talk about stoma later, most of the time we join the bowels back. And how we join the bowels back is either we, we stitch it back or we use a special device called a stapler. Now, it's not a usual paper stapler that we use for paper. These are uh, specially designed equipment that's used to join uh, our bowels back. Okay, so we use um, a stapler to join. Now, what about the rectum? The rectum is a little bit different than the colon. If you can imagine, as, as I said, in the male pelvis is very small. The size of the rectum is like the Coca-Cola can. Okay? And if you can imagine, if you have a tumor within a Coca-Cola can, how do you remove the tumor? You can't just remove the tumor leaving the rectum behind. You've got to remove the rectum together. And that is really the challenge and the technical difficulties in doing such a surgery. And in fact, um, what was, um, yeah, so you just can't remove that. So, and as I said, you can't remove the rectum on its own. You have to remove the, um, now the, the fat surrounding it because the fat surrounding it contains the lymph nodes. Okay, so what was discovered and it's only really about in the 1980s that we discovered this. Because before that, surgeons were just removing the rectum without removing the fat around it. And what, it, when what occurred was that these patients, we found 60 to 70% of them would have the cancer coming back. So we found that we've got to remove the fat around it because the fat around it contains the lymph nodes, right? And it was really this guy, um, uh, Bill Hill in 1982, that, that uh, revolutionized rectal cancer surgery. So what he did was that he described and I was very fortunate to meet him, um, to actually remove the, the rectum together with the fat and the lymph nodes surrounding it. And what he found was that he managed to reduce the recurrence rates from you know, 60, 70% to less than 10%, and these patients lived uh, longer and longer. So then again, similarly to the colon, when you have two ends, what do you do with them? We normally join them back. So when we join the colon back, we, it's very difficult to stitch inside the rectum because it's a very narrow area, as I said. So we have this gun-like material, uh, sorry, this gun-like uh, tool. It's also called a stapler where it comes from the anus and we insert it from below. It goes up and you can see here that the bowels are, are joined. So this is how we join our bowels, the, the rectum back. Now, when it comes to surgery, I'm sure many of you have heard open versus keyhole or laparoscopic, and there's also now robotic. So we talk about open surgery, it basically means a cut through the abdomen, right through the belly button, right? And this is what you see. It's, uh, it's a messy surgery, but this is what we all are trained with. But nowadays, um, I, by default, try to give the patient um, uh, keyhole surgery or laparoscopic surgery because uh, it's, 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 um, it's less painful. Inside, this, it's the same. So we remove... Uh, I mean, inside it's the same in terms of the concept that I just showed. We remove the bowel together with the lymph nodes. So it's basically inside it's the same, but with smaller wounds, okay, with smaller wounds, uh, even though you might see many uh, little wounds here, but trust me, the pain is much less. Patients recover faster and they, 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 they go home faster. And in terms of cancer removal, it's really the same. So this is why it looks inside. And if you compare or to the open wound, you can see that you know, there's, there's a marked difference and patients who have small keyhole uh, wounds, um, usually by three to six months, you probably won't even notice that there's much of a wound there. Now, unless there's really, really, really small tumors, then you can do local resections and uh, especially in the rectum. So these are uh, specially designed instruments that we use. And I, I, this is me performing a surgery through the anus, um, removing a very small rectal tumor. So these kind of patients, if you're fortunate to, uh, I mean, if you're un unfortunate to get cancer, but you're fortunate that the cancers are small enough, then you can actually uh, do the surgery in this way. Of course, as I said, because the male pelvis is so small, sometimes you have a big tumor, it's very difficult to operate. Though nowadays we have the robot. So what the robot does is not the robot himself do the surgery, the surgeon controls the robot. Okay, and you can see here that, um, you can see here on the, on the left, Sorry, on the left is that the, uh, uh, the, the, the operation is being done. And here, nowadays, we can have single ports and you have this robotic, this uh, alien-like uh, equipment that can do the surgery with just one hole. So that would be the future. Okay, and um, these are all, all the new uh, instruments that are used to, to perform uh, these surgeries. And of course, uh, you know, you have industries like Google and Johnson & Johnson joining up and creating new and newer robots. So that's going to be an exciting field of surgery for the next 10 to 20 years. 
Now, you cannot escape talking about stomas when you're talking about surgical management of cancers. Um, so when you talk about stomas, it, there are two kinds of stomas. They're either permanent or they're temporary. And in permanent stomas, it usually involves cancers that are involving the anal sphincter. The anal sphincters are muscles that control your anus. And if the tumor touches that, you cannot save the sphincter. You save the sphincter because the patient doesn't want a stoma, the cancer is left behind, the cancer comes back. It's not good, right? So in, this, in such a case, if you remove the, the rectum, then what happens to, to this end of the colon, then it brought, it's being brought up as a stoma and the patient, the patient has a permanent stoma. However, there are times when the stoma can be temporary. For example, when we join the rectum back, and in such a case where the tumor does not involve the, the muscle that control the anus, then we can create a little stoma that basically diverts the stool away from the joint so that the joint can heal well and that the patient can, uh, and maybe down, maybe three to six months after the first surgery, you can reverse the stoma and hopefully then the patient will be able to pass motion uh, almost like normal. So really having a stoma is not really the end of the world. I have had a friend who was a 40 year old doctor when he had cancer, uh, he had his anus removed, he had a stoma. And um, right now he's climbing mountains, he's swimming. So it's really not the end of the world. Obviously it's not a good thing to have, but it's something that, that if there is a chance for a cure, uh, I'm sure many patients will, uh, wouldn't mind uh, having it. Okay, so having said that, there's really no place for these guys. Because I have seen patients, when you talk about stoma, they're so scared, they run away. Okay, and then uh, they run away, they come back six months later, they see these guys, and really, um, then by then the tumor, it's a bit too late to, to do much. Now, after the surgery, the patient goes back to the ward, all right, and um, recovery depends. Uh, we'll usually give some painkillers, some antibiotics. You get a physiotherapy to come and help move you, help you breathe. And then when it comes to feeding, usually immediately after surgery, we don't give food immediately. Patients generally get fluids and then slowly are introduced to soft food. Eventually, by the time they go home after a week, then they can eat like normal, right? And if they have a stoma, they're taught how to care for it. Now, as I said, if, if surgery is keyhole, usually recovery is faster. I have patients going back within three to five days. And if they are um, undergoing the big open surgery, then usually it's a bit later. Now, what is the risk of this surgery? And it's always good to tell the patients the risk because a lot of times, the, you know, people paint a very rosy picture of things, but there's always a risk. Every surgery, there's a risk. So it's, a, it's the role of the surgeon to tell the patient. So the worst thing that can happen is that there, there is a leak. And a leak means that where you join, okay, there is stool coming out and that stool into the abdomen is not good. So the risk of leak is there, but it's actually quite relatively small. So it's about 5 to 8%. The patient has to be aware that for every 100 patients that you operate, about five patients might, might leak. Okay, there are other less, so another complication that can happen is a wound infection. So if the patient is malnourished, there's not much protein, the patient hasn't been eating very well, you do a big surgery, especially if it's a big cut, there's a high risk of a wound infection. In this picture, for example, the wound breaks down, the bowel pops out. It's a messy thing, we try to avoid that. Of course, there are other uh, complications like lung infections, urine infections, and if patients don't move, because we always encourage patients to move uh, as fast as possible. So, but if they don't move, then they run a risk of having a deep vein thrombosis, and uh, that then you know that that can re lead to disastrous complications. Now, after the patient goes home, um, he will normally come to see me after two weeks. I'll check his wound, I'll examine him. If he has a stoma, I will see how he's managing the stoma. Does he have any problems? But one, one of the most important things that I will do is actually review the results of the tumor that I've removed because I need to know what stage exactly is it. I like to see whether the lymph nodes are involved or not because if the lymph nodes are involved, then it's a stage three. And in these cases, especially, then these cases are referred to Dr. Mastura or, or to another oncologist for uh, further treatment, right? So these patients are generally seen every three months for the next five years or so, or well, two to three to five years. I will, um, every time they come to see me, we've got to check for the tumor marker called the CEA. We've got to do a yearly colonoscopies and yearly CT scans just to make sure that this thing doesn't come back. Now, like I said, when managing patients, it's never a decision of one person. Nowadays, it's always really a team effort. 
and the patient can be rest assured that whatever decision is made, especially in you know in, in, in hospital like ours, Pantai Hospital, where we really have a good team, it's always um, a, a joint effort between many uh, professionals. So what is the take home message I'd like to take here? Number one, unless it's an emergency, surgery always requires expensive planning, all right? So we try to avoid an emergency. It's very important for you to detect these cancers early. And the type of surgery depends on the location of the cancers, which, which I have shown earlier. And the, really the general concept of removing cancers is that you've got to remove the bowel together with the lymph nodes. And you've got to remove it all in one piece, okay? And having a stoma is a possibility. Um, and it should not be taught as the end of the world. If you can be cured because, if you can be cured, uh, and it would result in a stoma, then I think it is worth it, okay? And colorectal cancer management requires really a multidisciplinary approach. So, right, that's all. Thank you very much. And um, I'm uh, very glad to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, doctor. Uh, and I think uh, lovely that you actually took us through the entire patient kind of um, experience and the possibilities and all the different avenues that they have as well. But just, I think about a couple of questions, if you're a little okay for time, are you okay, doctor? Yeah, yeah, sure. Oh, yeah. A little bit, okay, lovely, lovely. The, the, there's one question from a viewer and, and this person asks is, what is the largest, what is the, I, I don't know, largest, biggest thing that I need to be worried about if I'm going for surgery in terms of colorectal cancer? Okay, well, I think, there are two things that um, the, the patient has to be aware of. And this is what I always tell the patient. Number one, we want to remove the cancer. But number two, we always want to make sure that at the end of the day, safety is very important. It's the, probably the most important. There's no use that I remove the cancer and you become more sick or you might die. Okay, then, then you know, sometimes, then in that case, sometimes it's better not to do anything. So the greatest uh, risk of, this surgery is basically number one, the, the, the immediate risk is obviously a leak, okay? Because especially when you join the bowel. So sometimes, as I said, when, we, when the surgeon thinks that it's not safe, uh, when he joins the bowel, then he would create a temporary bag or stoma so that the stool doesn't disturb that place. The other thing that I would probably be scared, but that's probably more the long-term is recurrent. So what you do need to do is, um, you need a, a, a good team, you need a good surgeon who, who, who does this thing regularly because if somebody does cancer surgery once a month or once every two months, then it's really, it's, um, you know, it, uh, it's different than a person doing it, uh, you know, two or three cancers a week. So obviously um, the risk is that, and studies have actually shown that somebody that, who does it often enough actually uh, results in these cancers coming back less as opposed to somebody who does it very infrequently um, because of, uh, you know, you might be leaving cancer behind. So I think that is the, probably the greatest fear, leaving cancer behind. Um, that would be the, the, the greatest risk. Yeah, yeah. Well, doctor. There's, there's also another question on when, um, and, and it's a bit convoluted, I'm trying to rephrase this, on uh, when uh, do you decide not to have surgery on colorectal cancer? Okay. So as I said, um, there is a patient factor and there's a cancer factor, okay? Now, the patient factor is that if the patient is just uh, too ill, okay? You might have a patient who is bedridden, who has stroke and whose quality of life is, is just not, it's, it's just too bad. And even if he has cancer, which is curable, then sometimes you need to discuss with the family, is this the best thing to do? Because he might not survive the surgery, right? So that would be the, the patient factor. Now, the other thing is the, is the, is the tumor factor. Now, the tumor factor is when, um, if the patient has very little symptoms, but the, the tumor has spread everywhere. Unfortunately, there are patients like that, who they have liver cancer, the, the tumor has gone to the liver, has gone to the lungs, right? And, but the patient has no problem. He, he can pass motion, there's no bleeding then performing the surgery would delay the control of the, uh, of the tumors in the lung and the liver. And these patients would probably, they might need surgery at some point, but they would probably go towards to see Dr. Mastura for oncology treatment first. Get the chemotherapy or, or radiotherapy for that matter to control the uh, liver and lung first. Then maybe if he survives it, then um, we can remove the primary cancer. 
so there are uh, very well they're not common but but there are times when when we don't do anything at the end of the day patient comes first it's not about the surgeon the surgeon likes to cut but sometimes we have to remind ourselves that look what is best for the patient this is not the, this is not the best thing to do we shouldn't operate yeah right uh, thank you, Doctor. I'm going to steal one question uh, from your, uh, I mean, into the time, going to injury time a little bit, and ask yep. you a little bit about how important nutrition is in like uh, management of, of colorectal cancer for a patient. Because you mentioned just now that when you have very poor nutrition, uh, that actually yep. plays a, quite a big role in recovery. Yep. Yes. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, sorry about, um, I, I didn't, because in the interest of time, I, I, I couldn't squeeze everything in. Right. But <laughs> But, but when it comes to nutrition, um, a lot of patients who are diagnosed with cancer have to a certain amount, have a certain amount of uh, uh, malnourishment. And when they come to see me in the clinic, uh, I mean, it's an emergency, I can't help much. But if, it's, if they come to see me in the clinic, we can plan. Now, sometimes it's worth to delay the surgery up to two weeks. Okay, now because, and then in such a case, I will prescribe the patient some, some supplements. But I wouldn't say it's supplements. I would probably say it's... Uh, it's a, what we call a nutritional support, oral nutritional support. So there are many brands, for example, they are uh, Ensure or they could be Glucina or they could be, you know, Nutrients, all the different, different brands are out there. And I would tell the patient, take this, take this uh, powder, powdered milk most of the time. Take this powdered milk as if you're taking antibiotics. Take it twice a day for the next two weeks because this, this, uh, these powders, they actually contain very high amount of protein. Okay, and this protein is needed for wound healing to fight infection. So by the time you come for surgery, you actually at least uh, top up that, 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 that protein reserve. So you undergo the surgery. And then after the surgery, once you're allowed to eat, you have to continue this, uh, this product for at least another month. Because even after you go home, I know you're eating well, but you probably would still need this extra push to make, um, you know, to, to improve your outcome. Uh, because if you don't do that, then uh, you have a higher chance of wound infection. You have a higher chance of uh, bowel leakage, and uh, the patients. And you know, studies have shown that patients have a higher chance of dying if they are too too weak for surgery. Yeah. Right. So um, thank you, thank you so much, doctor, once again. And I think the very kind of relevant and insightful points I, you did share with us a little bit of a take home. One message, if uh, you could. Uh, uh, oh, okay. I'm sorry. There's a question. If, if you're okay to take it, yes, sure. another last question. Okay. Oh, this one super complicated. Like, okay. Uh, with the sigmoid colon, with the sigmoid colon cancer and malignant infiltration into the omentum, can three the three hole surgery be used instead of opening a hole in the entire stomach? Oh, I mean, okay. That's a good question. Um, okay. Actually. Um, uh, you can do keyhole surgery in almost any situation unless the tumor has invaded into another organ, like, for example, uh, the bladder, or has involved into um, some small intestines, sometimes it's technically difficult. If it's just the omentum, you still can remove the omentum together with the tumor. That's not a problem. Omentum is just loose fat. That's okay. But, you know, if if it's so big that it invades into bone and into, in, and I, when I was in Australia, they, they, they do really big surgeries where tumors of the rectum invade into the bone, into the prostate, into the bladder, and patients undergo these huge surgeries. Um, and, you know, because it's a very big center, they have good success rate. So, but they don't do it keyhole. They always do it in open surgery. So as a laparoscopic surgeon, I always have to know my limitations. If I can't do it, I will tell the patient, look, we can't do it keyhole. Just got to do it open. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, got it, doctor. Thank you so much. Thank Ladies you. And gentlemen, we, we were with uh, Dr. Lokman Maslan today. He's a consultant colorectal and general surgeon at Pantai Hospital, Icro. And some of the good things that I think Dr. Uh, Lokman <laughs> managed to kind of share. There's one more. Uh, sorry, Pantai Hospital, Kuala Lumpur. Oh my God, sorry. There's so many Pantais. We've been doing quite a few Pantais. Okay, Pantai Hospital, Kuala Lumpur, Kuala Lumpur. And... Uh, and uh, what, what I think among the good things that Dr. kind of highlighted today is the entire patient experience within the colorectal cancer journey and uh, the importance of, of uh, surgery in that process. What are the things that you can do and, and you should be doing? And especially don't be afraid of facing surgery in colorectal 
cancer that seems to be still one of the best things that you can do in managing your cancer. So thank you very much, doctor. Very good evening to you and we hope to see you thank soon. You. And thank you very to much. see him thank in you. KL, Kuala Lumpur, bukan micro. Terima kasih. Okay, thank you, doctor. Good evening. Okay, and um, if you notice uh, this evening, ladies and gentlemen, we've had a three course dinner. We've had um, the starter, which is Dr. Alex, and then we've had main course, which is Dr. Lokman. And now for dessert, we will be speaking to Dr. Mastura Mohamed Yusuf. Dr. Mastura is a consultant clinical oncologist at Pantai Hospital Kuala Lumpur, our partner for uh, the cancer and eye series for this evening. And again, Dr. Mastura needs no introduction, uh, but for those who have uh, be, or perhaps are joining us from somewhere other than Malaysia, uh, Dr. Mastura is an eminent um, oncologist. She, she does a lot of patient engagement. She speaks and uh, does a lot of uh, social media as well as a lot of educational and awareness programs. So we will be very fortunate and privileged to have Dr. Mastura with us this evening. Thank you so much for joining us, Doctor. Thank you, Morley. Hi, everyone. Okay. Ah, and uh, and um, as dessert, um, <laughs> this is the sweetest dish, but uh, the <laughs> most important dish because you go home either feeling good after dessert or dessert is so lousy that you never want to go back to the same restaurant. So today, Dr. Mastura will be giving you the sweet insights into oncological management of surgical of colorectal cancer. So Dr. Lokman spoke to us about how the surgical aspect of management is. And um, one of the things that is increasingly becoming important in management of colorectal cancer is the journey for the patients in terms of multidisciplinary management. And tonight to kind of close that loop is Dr. Mastura who will speak to us about oncological management. Uh, doctor, the screen is all yours. Um, okay. Thank you so much. Right. Uh, okay. Okay, um, I think you can see it already, right? Very good evening, everyone. And thank you to the organizing committee for inviting me to give this uh, talk today. So I think we've heard uh, the, the two speakers, uh, the excellent talk by Dr. Luqman and Dr. Alex on colorectal cancer. And I guess uh, you all know already that colorectal cancer consists of the colon and then the rectum. And this, big, this uh, chart basically shows the colorectal region. And why we are discussing it together is because they share the same uh, you know, risk factors, the same epidemiology, uh, etiology, and, and, and sometimes, somewhat the treatment is nearly the same. And um, for surgery is the primary treatment and we have heard about surgery earlier and it consists of total resection of tumor and removal of lymph nodes. And of course, surgery will be uh, carried out after uh, you know, the patient has been diagnosed, has been confirmed to have cancer and also have been staged appropriately. And beyond surgery, of course, we have systemic therapies, which can be chemotherapy, target therapy or immunotherapy. So systemic therapies basically means that these are treatment that we give through the uh, blood system and therefore it's carried all over the body. And we do have patients with colorectal cancer treated with radiotherapy. These are the rectal cancer patients or patients who have colon or rectal cancer that has metastasis and sometimes we give radiation for palliation. And there are also patients that receive palliative care and supportive therapies. So what is important for us to, to, to show in the introduction is that the prognosis of colorectal cancer has improved a lot in the past decades, especially in the developed countries, but we are not really you know, far behind. And this is mainly because of primary pre preventive measures, uh, improved uh, method of screening, uh, the removal of polyps, as well uh, as well as early detection, and of course, improved uh, treatment. You can see in the chart where from the period of diagnosis, you can see male and female, the, uh, the, the prognosis of patients is much better. So again and again, we hear that the treatment principle for, for colorectal cancer is multidisciplinary care. There's no, no one patient that is managed by one doctor alone. So uh, patients are treated uh, with chemotherapy, surgery, radiation, and there is a coordination of care between all these specialties. And this often lead to the best outcome for our patients with care given if they have side effects or you know, adverse event as a result of each of the different treatments that they receive. And of course, we have other uh, specialties that are other than 
just chemo surgery and radiation. We have pathologists, radiologists, we have our intervention radiologists, stoma nurses, and other healthcare pro professionals that are involved in the care of the patient with colorectal cancer. So before we talk about the management aspect other than surgery, we have to understand that we categorize the patients into early stage or advanced stage. So when we want to categorize these patients into these two uh, uh, subgroups, then of course we have to know their stages. So uh, we have uh, listened earlier to the stages. Dr. Luman has gone through uh, uh, staging uh, rather in detail, but basically how you can see here, if the patients uh, have tumors that are uh, involving the, the bowel wall, either is in just in the inner lining or, or going to the muscle or into the outside the muscle, the bowel wall, which is a serosa, or involving the lymph nodes that they are in the early stage cancers. That means they have stage one to three cancers. But if they have distance spread to other organs, then they are advanced stage cancers. So we are going to discuss this rather differently. And their prognosis, of course, rather different. So before I, uh, I start on the early stage colon cancer, then I, I, I'm going to discuss this case so that we can uh, understand this better. So um, this is Mary, who's a 51-year-old female, and she presented with altered bowel habits. So that's a common presentation for colorectal cancer. And of course, Mary undergoes a colonoscopy to look at why she has altered bowel habit, and that found an ulcerating tumor in the left colon. So a biopsy was done, and that uh, came back as adenocarcinoma. That's the most common type of col colorectal cancer. And she had a staging CT scan uh, of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis, and this, this did not show any metastasis. So Mary then undergoes a laparoscop laparoscopic surgery to remove her cancer. So on uh, the post-operative day seven, the pathology report was available for her. It was a moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma. So we are, we are going to go to uh, what if um, the tumor is three by three centimeter and extends just into the inner, inner muscle of the bowel wall without any regional lymph nodes involvement. So Mary now has stage one cancer of the colon. So in Mary's case, if she has stage one cancer of the colon, there's no need for any adjuvant treatment. The surgery alone is enough and, and it is uh, uh, the, the, the likelihood of Mary surviving the cancer is very good at beyond 95%. Say that the cancer now extends through to the serosa of the bowel wall and also involve the adjacent uterus. Uterus uh, is a female organ that is quite close to uh, the colon. So, and there is no regional lymph nodes that were involved uh, in this uh, surgery and, and thus Mary now has stage 2B cancers. And what if it goes further, it extends into the subserosa and two out of 12 lymph nodes that were removed were positive for cancer. So now Mary has stage 3 cancer. So those patients like Mary who have either stage 2B or stage 3, so between stage 2 to stage 3, they have a, you know, a risk factor for recurrence. So their cancer is not so early. So there's a risk factor for recurrence, therefore they require adjuvant therapy. Okay? So adjuvant therapy is basically treatment that we give either before or after the surgery as an adjunct to the surgery. That means that the surgery removes the, you know, the gross tumor, the gross lymph nodes, but this uh, treatment that is aimed towards any microscopic cells means disease that you cannot see with your eye, you cannot check with the blood, uh, you know, blood test, you cannot uh, you know, scan it further, you can't, you can't actually see it. So you just, based from the staging, you, you, can, uh, you assume or consider that there are some microscopic disease left behind. So they, and the aim of giving the adjuvant therapy is to cure. It's actually a curative uh, treatment. So if you give it in the post-operative uh, setting in the colon and rectal cancer patient, then this is to eliminate any remnant cells. But in patients who have rectal cancer, you could give the treatment before the surgery. We call it neoadjuvant or preoperative. So this is given with the aim to not just um, improve the survival by eliminating all the uh, microscopic tumors but also to allow um, better local control for the rectal cancer and also to maybe to have a sphincter preservation. This is for patients who have low rectal tumor and therefore you would like to get them not to end up with a, with a stoma for the rest of their lives. So you give a treatment in order to get the tumor to be away from the anal sphincter and therefore a, a better surgery could be carried out. So this is the picture showing that 
the cancer before radiation in the rectum and then the cancer shrinks after the radiation has been given. And this is just to show how low rectal tumor may benefit from new adjuvant radiotherapy or new adjuvant chemo radiotherapy before they go for surgery and therefore the patient may have a better quality of life. So in terms of adjuvant therapy you, with the use of chemotherapy in patients with stage 3 colon cancer, it has been um, confirmed or it has been uh, shown in large, large studies. And this is just to show a meta-analysis with, with over 13,000 patients who had stage 3 colon cancer. And they looked at the patients who had only surgery versus patients who had surgery plus 5U based chemotherapy as, as an adjuvant treatment. And you could see that for patients who have surgery plus chemotherapy, the improvement in their survival is about 10%. That is actually very, very good. So therefore, all stage 3 uh, colon cancer patients that, uh, that has had surgery uh, are required to have uh, chemotherapy. Okay. For stage 2 patients, these are patients who do not have any lymph node metastasis, but they may have some risk factors uh, present in their, in their pathology report that may increase their risk for recurrence. And for this uh, group of patients, uh, the, the, the study that have uh, shown that they also benefited with the usage of adjuvant chemo, but maybe not as much as stage 3, 10%, they benefited about 5.4% versus uh, patients who just had surgery alone. So there are factors that we oncologists will look at when we want to consider uh, chemotherapy for stage 2 uh, colorectal cancer. So some of it, uh, I, I put it here, for example, if they have a T4 tumor, like in Mary's case, stage 2B, when it has actually involved the adjacent uterus, or if the tumor is obstructed when they present or perforated uh, before or during surgery, and if the tumor is grade 3, means it's like you know, a uh, poorly differentiated tumor or they have invaded the lymphatic uh, channels or if the surgery uh, did not remove enough lymph nodes uh, for us to, to confirm uh, presence or absence of lymph node metastasis. So the adjuvant chemotherapy regimen that we usually use are 5U based. So usually it's either single 5U uh, based drug, either is 5-fluorouracil uh, or, or, or uh, capecitabine and, uh, or, or a combination of this uh, five u based regimen together with oxaliplatate. So is, you often hear Zelox or you often hear Fofox. So these are the regimen that we use. And the duration of giving this adjuvant chemotherapy is between three to six months, depending on your risk. And uh, whether you choose Fofox or Zelox will be based on the discussion that you have with your own oncologist, where we would discuss uh, each of these regimen and you know the need of chemoport and which is more convenient for you, cause and, and, and side effect and so on and so forth. All right. So for uh, early stage two to three rectal cancer besides chemotherapy, they may receive new adjuvant radiotherapy as alluded to earlier. And they may have new adjuvant radiotherapy followed by their TME surgery, or they could have a TME surgery followed by the post-operative radiotherapy. And why is this so? And that is because rectal cancer, like Dr. Luban said, is very different um, to colon cancer. So rectal cancer being uh, a bit lower in the, in the pelvic region, um, they are more likely to have a local recurrence, meaning a recurrence at the at the bed after the, 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 the organ has been removed. So this is actually a 3D reconstruction of the sites of relapse that we see in patients with rectal cancer. You can see here, when the patient just have surgery alone for rectal cancer, then these are the areas that the cancer may relapse. It means it is actually at the same place where the rectum was. But if they receive radiotherapy, then the sites of relapse, uh, you can see that it's actually less. So when we give radiation, the local recurrence rate for rectal cancer reduces. So it can... Basically, radiotherapy can safely cover the sites where rectal cancer is most likely to recur. So this is how we give the radiation. So we give it to the rectal region uh, and as well as the surrounding uh, lymphatic drainage for the rectum and any other tissues that we feel that may uh, lead to a local recurrence later. All right. So other than that, we of course we we consider other factors. So some some uh, you know uh, patients may come to the clinic and say, "Doctor, my my father is eighty years old." Uh, is it okay for him to actually receive or, you know, um, is it going to be detrimental to his uh, health and age? So we do consider all these factors when we decide on the chemotherapy regimen, the chemotherapy duration, but, but um, 
all in all, actually, um, patients who, who, who has no contraindication um, will benefit from the adjuvant treatment should they need it. And remember that the aim of the treatment is actually cure. So we would like to get the patient to live longer, not to get any relapse, and also to improve their quality of life. Okay, so, so now, despite uh, having surgery and chemotherapy, uh, the patients, after they have finished the chemotherapy, we, we then will put them on a, you know, on a regular follow-up surveillance. And that is because despite treatment, we are still not perfect. Some patients do recur. So the appro approximate recurrence rate by stage is as, uh, as I put here. And not just a recurrence, but they also have the risk of developing a second cancer in the future, especially when they live long uh, after they have been uh, you know, effectively treated for their initial uh, colorectal cancer. So according to the guideline, we have many guidelines, but according to guidelines, we do go, uh, you know, put patient on um, physical examination, history of physical examination every three months for two years. We check their CEA, we do colonoscopy according to the guideline recommendation. And also for those with high risk, we do actually perform a CT scan of the chest, abdomen, pelvis or a PET scan uh, to look for recurrence either six monthly or, or yearly, depending on the guideline that you use. So the importance of the follow-up, why we want to follow up and, and get the, this any relapse to, to, you know, to be detected early is because it is still treatable and uh, if we detect the cancer uh, when they have metastasized, it's still treatable when you know, we detect it early and we can actually improve the survival rate of the patient. So you could see that the recurrence rate over time is actually high uh, in the first two to three years and then it starts to you know, become low after that. So the first two to three years is the best time to, you know, to follow the, the patient uh, you know, rather very regularly and closely and this is actually the best opportunity to diagnose any early recurrence and then treat the patients. So um, cancer can be cured, especially when you diagnose it at early stage and you treat it appropriately and at the correct timing. And that is something that I want everyone to remember uh, for this talk. Right. So for the early stage, this is the summary. So you need optimal surgery, you need adequate staging, and you need multidisciplinary approach. The benefit of adjuvant chemotherapy is, uh, you know, in stage three is 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 uh, very established. In stage two, selection of patients according to their risk, they also benefit. And oxaliplatin uh, chemotherapy uh, is added to uh, the five view based chemotherapy in st stage three patients. And the, the, in terms of duration of chemotherapy, shorter duration can be considered. I, I mentioned three to six months, and this is associated with remarkable reduction in side effects. So these low-risk cancers, you can discuss with your doctor, your oncologist on um, getting between three to six months of treatment. Okay? So uh, I finished with early stage cancers. So now we are going to uh, advanced stage cancers. But of course, we, we're just going to discuss, uh, you know, in general, and we cannot go through the advanced, um, advancement in, in metastatic colorectal cancer because it's just too much, all right? So in, in almost 45% uh, of patients diagnosed with colorectal cancer will either present with advanced cancer at the first onset or eventually develop recurrence despite having treatment for the early stage cancers. And in these patients, if they do not have any treatment, usually the median survival is short. It's like probably about six months or maybe six months to one year. And um, colorectal cancer, these are the sites of involvement. Uh, you know, the prime, the, the, the liver is the, 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 you know, the favorite organ of involvement for colorectal cancer when they want to relapse or when they want to spread. But it also goes to lymph nodes, peritoneum, omentum, ovary, and of course, when they spread through the bloodstream, then they go to the lungs. So uh, this is also uh, patient uh, cases just to show how uh, they present. So for example, Mr. YY, who's a 50-year-old uh, gentleman who had stage 3 colon cancer in 2017, and he had surgery followed by full force chemotherapy for six months. And three years later, although he was asymptomatic, but during the visit to the clinic, he was noted to have a rising CEA. He was 2.4 and then now it's 15.3. So his oncologist did a PET scan and the PET scan shows, uh, showed uh, you know, a liver metastasis, um, a new liver metastasis. So he has a relapse of his metastatic colorectal cancer in the liver. 
On the other hand, uh, Mr. H, who is a 40-year-old young gentleman who presented with abdominal pain and parietal bleeding for three months. And he also mentions that he has cough and loss of weight for the past two months. And there was presence of a rectal tumor on colonoscopy and uh, imaging shows that he had uh, lung metastasis. So this is a gentleman young who has a de novo metastatic colorectal cancer, means advanced stage already at first presentation. So in patients with metastatic colorectal cancer, the goal of treatment basically centers around palliation. So it's, it's not like cure, but control of the symptoms, control of the tumor, lengthen the survival, and also improving the safety and flexibility uh, of the treatment and reducing toxicity and also enhancing the quality of life of the patient. So that is actually in general. And um, we have to go through a lot of factors to determine how we are going to treat the patient upfront and what is the first line uh, treatment for the patient. So there is again patient tumor and tumor and treatment factor. What is the patient's age? What is their performance status? You know, what is their existing illnesses besides the, beside the colorectal cancer? And uh, whether the tumor is resectable means that the liver or lung metastasis, whether you can actually remove them, whether they are very, very symptomatic for the disease. And then, you know, other, other things like uh, side, treatment side effects, maybe they still have numbness from their previous uh, Fofox or Zalox um, chemotherapy, uh, logistic, and also, of course, cost. Okay, so... Um, Surgery, uh, in, in, in this aspect, if let's say they have metastatic colorectal cancer already, is it, some patients ask me, do I have to remove my, my tumor now, my, my primary tumor now? So yes, sometimes surgery is indicated if the patient is obstructed, if the patient is you know, having massive bleeding, having massive pain, or the tumor is perforated, or they, they, you know, they, are, they are in a life-threatening situation. The, the tumors have to be removed. And, and in that instance, of course, the surgeon will have to manage the patient first, right? So in, in terms of uh, treatment advances, um, despite saying that it's actually palliation, it's just for control, you know, it's, it's just to uh, lengthen survival and improving the patient's quality of life, the management of stage 4 colorectal cancer has advanced markedly over the last probably 10, 15 years, okay? So last time we just have chemotherapy to treat this patient. Now we have new chemotherapy agents. We have new biological agents. And this has led to improvement in the patient survival. And we now go on to personalized medicine era where we basically look at the patient's tumor characteristic, the individual patient's tumor characteristic and provide the right care at the right time for the right person and in the right way. And for patients who actually have organ limited metastatic disease means that if they relapse or they they you know they present with stage 4 disease but they have limited uh, metastasis means that uh, it can be limited metastasis that can be removed so these are patients what we call patients with organ limited metastatic disease usually is the liver or lung and they can be considered for curative surgical resection of those organs and this has been associated with improve outcome and cure it means they can get you know 10 year survival uh, survival rate of 30 40% like that so that is what we call oligometastasis from metastatic colorectal cancer so basically the tumor evolve you know from just a small tumor they evolve to become this, they give out these small small mats before they become widespread diffuse metastasis and terminal disease so we need to basically catch this. And that's why it's very important that patients after they have completed their treatment go on their surveillance so that if they relapse, we can actually uh, detect it as early as possible. So oligometastatic colorectal cancer is defined as limited volume metastasis up to five metastatic spots in no more than three metastatic sites. And this typically involves the liver or lung and sometimes the peritoneum, leaf nodes and ovary. And for these patients, the treatment aim is for cure. So we remove the primary site or we control the primary site. We also remove or ablate the metastatic site so that we can get cure or prolong, prolonged survival. Okay, so this is uh, just an example showing surgery, liver, liver resection in patients with liver metastasis. And um, uh, this, this is basically showing how the survival rate will be increased in these patients who have undergone resection. So this is just to show studies looking at these patients who have surgery for their liver metastasis and surgery for their lung metastasis for colorectal cancer and how it has, they have 
uh, basically uh, benefited uh, with in terms of survival. So for patients who have uh, stage four disease but cannot uh, go through surgery for whatever reason, okay, there are other um, methods to control their cancer. So uh, some of them may go through uh, systemic treatment first to, to shrink or reduce the volume of the tumor and following which they will have all this treatment that I put up here. So either they have brachytherapy, for example, brachytherapy of the liver metastasis or stereotactic body radiotherapy of the liver metastasis. They can also undergo radiofrequency ablation, microwave or cryoablation, or they can have taste or they can have uh, SIRT. So there are various, but this can be discussed with the oncologist. Okay, what about the patients who cannot undergo the surgery or cannot go through um, all this uh, treatment for cure? So these are the patients who have probably more widespread disease and um, it's very important that we give them a very good systemic treatment in order to control the cancer. So chemotherapy has been and is still the base for the colorectal cancer stage four systemic treatment. And the majority of the situation, we would use five view based chemo again. And also we would combine them, uh, combine five view with oxaliplatin or irinotecan. So there's, a, there's an example of the combination. So other than that, other than the chemotherapy that we know, and we also have other chemotherapies that we use for stage four cancer, such as TES-102. And of course, uh, what we will discuss uh, later on is the biologics, the targeted treatment that have been uh, introduced to, to treat metastatic reactor in order for us to improve their outcome. So what is targeted therapy and how did targeted therapy come into um, the management of colorectal cancer? So much have much information that researchers have uh, identified in colorectal cancer came from the study on the adenoma, adenoma to carcinoma sequence, means that researchers look into the biology of colorectal cancer and they understood that uh, from a normal mucosa to become polyp and then to become cancer, this is basically a progressive and sequential uh, changes that happen in the colon that uh, is associated with mutations. So these mutations um, that has accumulated has been identified and um, we, um, we use this target in order for us to um, give rise to treatment that can um, block the process that has been uh, changed due to the mutation. So these drugs are called targeted therapy and these are basically uh, medicine or substances that basically block the growth and spread of cancer that has, been, uh, that has happened because of the mutation that has occurred. So the drug block the growth and spread of cancer by interfering with the molecules that is, that is involved in the growth and progression of the cancer. So when we focus on what is the problem within the cancer by focusing on the molecular and cellular changes that are specific to the cancer of this particular individual, then maybe this treatment will be more effective than giving them a very generic treatment such as chemotherapy. And if you focus on a character that is only happen or present within cancer, then perhaps your treatment will not uh, interfere with normal tissue. So that will not harm our normal cells. Okay. So the difference between chemotherapy and targeted therapy is that targeted therapy is tumor targeted. It doesn't co cause bone marrow suppression and you do not get any cumulative toxicities. So one of the targeted therapy that has been used in colorectal cancer is the anti-angiogenic agent. And this is targeting the process of angiogenesis, means that the process of the tumor making or, or attracting a blood supply to come to them. So when tumor gets uh, the blood supply, then of course they will grow and that will lead to metastasis. So we would like to actually interfere with this process. So this is uh, basically the process. And when you treat the, the patient with medication or targeted therapy against the angiogenic process, then you get Tumor, uh, tumor to be uh, stunted. So, okay, sorry. So the next target is the RAS target. This is a gene that is that occur commonly in colorectal cancer. And when when this these patients that that has this RAS uh, mutation, uh, you know, underlying their cancer, then we uh, use this information 
as a predictive uh, method in order for us not to use the anti-EGFR drug. So EGFR is, is, is another um, pathway or mechanism for cancer to grow. And patients who do not have the RAS mutation, then we can combine their chemo together with anti-EGFR drug in order to make the response of the therapy and their survival to be better. So um, in, in, in patients with colorectal cancer, other than what I have, the examples that I have I've just give, uh, given you, we also uh, target uh, what is the drug to use in their cancer according to which side of tumor uh, the patient has. So for example, if they have uh, a right-sided tumor, then we may use the anti-angiogenic drug together with three types of chemotherapy in, to treat them. Or if they have a left-sided tumor, then we may use uh, any of the anti-EGFR anti drug or, or the anti-EGFR drug together with chemotherapy if they uh, have RAS uh, wild-type disease. Okay, So to, re to just uh, make it simpler, the survival that has uh, been obtained when we use combination of chemotherapy and targeted therapy has increased so much, as you can see here, in, in comparison to just using chemotherapy alone in patients with metastatic colorectal cancer. So this uh, should be in our treatment uh, choices when we discuss with our patients. So this is basically the ongoing advances when we say that we personalize the treatment of metastatic colorectal cancer in patients uh, with this uh, condition. So we target the multiple pathways that is involved in the patient's tumor. So we Basically, what we do is we look into the patient's tumor and try to identify if there are any mutation that we can target. So whether it's RAS pathway, BRAF pathway, or HER2 pathway. And uh, in addition to that, we also look at whether the patient's tumor is, is immunogenic. It means that if, let's say, the tumor, the tumor uh, is going to respond to us using immunotherapy to treat the tumor. And of course, there are more and more uh, molecular definition of each of the patient's uh, tumor to, to, be, to look at in the future. So this is just to show uh, for immunotherapy, uh, we look at mismatch repair deficiency in order for us to use immunotherapy drug for such patients. So the reason for this uh, mismatch repair uh, issue in patients is that they are not able to um, um, activate their immune system to uh, counter or, or attack the, the tumor. So in order for us to improve on that is we treat them with immunotherapy and, and then that will basically the immunotherapy will enhance the body immune response and then the immune response will attack the tumor. Okay. So this this uh, I will just uh, so this is uh, the study design looking at this aspect for patients who have the MMR uh, uh, deficiency and using immunotherapy in, in the patient. And that has led to uh, approval of immunotherapy use in the patients who has that characteristic, which is the MSIH or MMR defect. So uh, for the immunotherapy, I, I, I have this patient here to share with you. So this is Mr. AA, who is a 52-year-old banker. So he has advanced metastatic colorectal cancer with uh, involvement of the lymph nodes in the abdomen and abdominal wall metastasis, the one that I have uh, identified here. So when we look into his tumor, we find that his tumor has a microsatellite instability high type of cancer. So despite him having the standard chemotherapy of, uh, for eight cycles, he did not have any response at his tumor here. And he also had uh, some side effects from the chemotherapy, a numbness, a neuropathy of the hands and abdominal pain, and he was not able to work because of that. So this is his parietic lymph nodes. And this one is the, uh, the, the tumor in the abdominal wall as, as seen on the PET scan. So because of his MSIH uh, type of cancer, I gave him immunotherapy treatment with pembrolizumab. And this is basically um, the response. As you can see here, this uh, tumor in the abdominal wall that did not respond at all with chemotherapy has basically resolved, I mean, disappeared. And the tumor in the paraiotic region also disappeared uh, with this treatment. And this, this treatment was given over four months. So uh, we have, uh, you know, um, algorithm on how to treat the patients. So patients may go, if they have, if they can be resected, then they go on the oligometastatic pathway. If they can be potentially resected, then they go on the 
you know, giving them chemotherapy first to shrink the tumor and then maybe they can go for resection. And if they have, uh, they do, cannot go for any of this, then they go for the systemic treatment uh, module where they can have combination therapy or maybe they have a monotherapy depending on their fitness criteria. So when they... Um, when they uh, progress and they go on a second line or third line. So we follow uh, the algorithm and this is something that you can also discuss with your oncologist. So a summary for the metastatic colorectal cancer. Again, we need improved diagnostic tools and earlier detection recurrence to widen our opportunity to treat patients for cure. A coordinated multidisciplinary strategy is required for us to optimize the outcome for these patients with metastatic colorectal cancer. If the patient have oligometastasis, then we should resect it for, to improve their survival and cure. And chemotherapy and targeted therapy agents have consistently shown efficacy across all treatment goals in these multiple settings, improve survival and is the most effective and uh, it is tolerable and should be used within a multidisciplinary context. And uh, immunotherapy for patients who have MSI H type of tumor have shown promise and uh, should be considered when the indication is, uh, um, is there. Okay, with that, I thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor. And as, as usual, thank you, thank you for really kind of putting very quickly into perspective the whole kind of um, area of management uh, in terms of oncology and colorectal cancer. There's a couple of questions, Doctor, and they seem to keep coming in as well. Are you okay with taking a few questions? Yeah. Okay, okay. lovely, Doctor. There's one on... Um, um, I think this is really quite uh, general. What and when is the earliest kind of uh, point at which we know there's colorectal cancer? Um, okay, the, the method of detecting the colorectal cancer or, or knowing that uh, colorectal cancer will be I, two. Either patient have symptoms or the patient go for screening. So the earliest is actually when patients go for screening. So screening means the patient do not have symptoms, yet they go on, uh, you know, uh, they go um, willingly to have a scope done um, to see whether they have uh, a polyp or maybe cancer, you know. So screening uh, is, the, is the method to, to detect the cancer the earliest possible. And of course, there are patients that, possibly uh, go on uh, what I call, um, how to say, uh, they have symptoms and they, uh, symptoms that is not so uh, apparent like, 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 um, like peractal bleeding, but they just have like, some, you know, abdominal discomfort or they have like, um, um, uh, what do you call it, um, tiredness. Uh, and then they go and see some, uh, a, a gastro and then they get the, the, the cancer to be diagnosed. So that, that's the earliest, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Okay, doctor. Um, there's, there's another question and, and this seems to be, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just paraphrasing the question. Yeah. If uh, somebody has already had stage two colon cancer, gone through chemotherapy and surgery, and now has now found out that the can cancer is already, already metastasized to the liver, um, what is the best kind of uh, treatment choices that is available or can be looked at okay if the patient has stage 2 cancer and has um, you know has relapse then we we look at few things what is the duration of control means that how long has it been since the cancer treatment to the to the relapse happening so if let's say the patient has stage 2 cancer but within 6 months the cancer relapse in comparison to someone who has stage 2 cancer 10 years ago and then now the cancer relapsed. Okay? So that is one. That is the mean disease tempo. Second is what is the volume we are talking about. So whether there, you know, uh, there are a lot of tumors in most part of the liver or they have it's just oligometastasis, so one, three you know, tumors in one part of the liver. So if the patient has, uh, has had adequate staging, means that there is no other disease elsewhere, and the patient has good um, disease-free interval, means five, 10 years from the last uh, diagnosis to now, and you know one to three uh, liver metastasis, then the patient should go for upfront resection of the liver. Okay? If the patient has um, within six months relapse, right? within six months relapse, and although this is one to three liver metastasis, then I suggest that a biopsy be carried out and a molecular analysis be done on the liver metastasis 
to find out to, or to identify the, the, the tumor further because it could be a tumor that is aggressive. You know, BRAF mm -hmm. mutation positive is aggressive. So, so if the tumor is aggressive, perhaps a combination of systemic treatment plus possibly resection should, should be uh, what, what is to be discussed. Okay, so in the event that the patient has, you know, uh, a lot of the liver is involved with, with cancer, then of course, mm -hmm. systemic treatment first. Systemic treatment first to control the, the disease and then later on reevaluate if the patient do not have disease elsewhere and the, the tumor in the liver has you know shrunken to quite a good uh, size or good number, then you can go for a local therapy after that. So there are various um, permutation, I would say. Yeah, yeah, true. And and I think it's worth to mention to the audience as well, uh, doctor. And I think you definitely agree with me. There's no substitute for a personalized consultation. You know, as much as Dr. Mastura is giving you all these kind of um, very general, broad ideas, and that's really to kind of give you an idea of where the treatment can go. There's nothing that kind of will substitute for meeting the oncologist in person and kind of discussing all the different modalities of the case. I think that's both right. Dr. Lokman and Dr. Mastura were saying today about how each cancer is unique and you're not only treating the cancer, but also the patient. Yeah, so and because, without doctors actually seeing you, there's no way yeah. that that can happen, isn't it, doctor? Yeah, it's, it's, it's also important uh, for me to see the patient's attitude, you know, um, you know the, what is the patient's personal wish. So, um, yeah, so discussion personally uh, and getting all the information in hand and, you know, look, and then trying to... Uh, map it you know map it and then get get the best uh, kind of approaches for each patient is very very important right uh, absolutely doctor doctor there's just uh, i think we'll we'll take another two more questions um there's one on uh, my, uh, uh in a late i think a, a senior person about 80 years old uh, has colorectal cancer stage three um, has undergone radiotherapy but no shrinking of the tumor post radiotherapy any kind of broad idea on where we can take <laughs> the next stages of treatment again so general that okay so for rectal cancer there are two methods of giving radiation uh, in the new adjuvant setting so one is we give we call it short course radiotherapy means that we give five large doses of radiation over five days and then the patient will have surgery about one to two weeks after that. So this one is given just radiotherapy alone and um, without chemotherapy, okay? Without chemotherapy. And the other one is called a long course radiotherapy, means that the radiotherapy is given over five weeks and this is usually given together with chemotherapy. So it's a concurrent chemo radiotherapy and the radiotherapy is given over a long course. So um, before I can un un you know, answer that, I, I in my mind, I'm thinking, um, how big was the tumor at presentation? What is the method of giving radiation? Are they short course or long course? Okay, and um, uh, and even for the patient who have a, a long course treatment, whether they are compliant, you know, some some of them probably will not finish their, their treatment or they don't take their their, their chemotherapy, uh, you know, during the, the treatment. So um, taking all this into place, if let's say the the patient uh, does not do not. Let's say the patient has had a, a, a good treatment, but do not respond to the to the radiotherapy, and is still surgically operable. Then I guess it has to be done, and of course it's going to be an APR maybe, and and then the patient need to be uh, followed up closely because these are the patient that you know might uh, have high risk for recurrence. So I know of the age factor, uh, 80 year old, but um, colorectal cancer happens in, in aging uh, patients. So we have patients who are you know, 65 and above. So should they be um, fit enough to undergo a long course radiotherapy? I, I'm suppo I suppose that they, they should be fit enough to, un to undergo um, surgery. Surgery, surgery. Yeah. I'm, going to, I'm going to kind of um, end with, with this question, Doctor. It seems to be a sexier question. Uh, on uh, what are your thoughts on this this new CAR T cell therapy and, and its <laughs> use in, in colorectal cancer? This a, seems to be a sexier question. Like, you know. <laughs> okay, so CAR T CAR T therapy at present is not 
uh, used in clinic setting or is not also recommended. It's not even in clinical trial for metastatic colorectal cancer or early stage colorectal cancer. So this is an approach that is used mainly for hematological cancers. I know of some case reports of uh, this method being used in some, some patients' solid tumors, but these are merely uh, case reports. So we cannot and should not use it to treat uh, patients with metastatic colorectal cancer because there is no data and there are many, many other treatment uh, uh, options that has shown to be effective that we should use first uh, before we go to CAR T therapy. In addition, it's, it's, it's like so, so expensive. So, you know, um, don't, don't go for it um, just because it's expensive and it should be good. It isn't. Yeah. And so that, that's my, my advice on this. Right. Thank you so much, doctor. And I'm, and I'm sure, I, I mean, the thing is, um, we could carry on talking to you the whole night and people still keep on posing questions. <laughs> it, uh, we really would like to thank you for kindly taking all these questions and, and sharing so much with us as well. And, you know, always we, we look forward to seeing you in, in all these various sessions that you continue to do to educate the public. Thank you so much for that as well. So thank it's you. been wonderful having you with us this evening and thank you for the sharing. And I think it's given quite a bit uh, of information to those who are kind of dealing with colorectal cancer, as well as those who hopefully will never have to face colorectal cancer, but you know, with the numbers as it is, yeah. we are looking at- uh, Actually, it's the, first, the it's the first cancer among males in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Exactly. It has superseded okay. co uh, colon cancer. Uh, it has superseded lung cancer, sorry. Lung cancer. Yeah. Mm. As, as we wrap up the evening, doctor, could I kindly ask you to kind of give a takeaway for our viewers and you know. Ah, okay, so the takeaway message is um, the cancer can be cured if you detect it early. Screening are uh, available and you should take it up. Uh, and third is if you have um, stage four cancers, you have a lot of options out there. So you shouldn't feel disheartened and you should go for treatment. Right, thank you so much, doctor. Good evening. Um, ladies and gentlemen, this was um, Dr. Mastura Muhammad Yusuf, consultant clinical oncologist at Pantai Hospital, Kuala Lumpur. I got it right this time. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, we've had a wonderful evening and, and you've, you've had uh, the wonderful opportunity of listening to these three eminent physicians, Dr. Alex Liao, consultant gastroenterologist and hepatologist, Dr. Lokman Maslan, consultant colorectal and, and general surgeon, and Dr. Mastura Mohamed Yusuf, consultant clinical oncologist, all serving at Pantai Hospital Kuala Lumpur. And they've shared to us about the entire patient journey in terms of the multi multidisciplinary management of colorectal cancer. So I hope that this has been a very fruitful and insightful evening. And um, we hope to see you soon uh, at the next session of Cancer and I. With that, I bid you all good night. <laughs>